afternoon, everyone. Once again, thank you all so very much for coming to the 25th Annual Energy Fair. My name is Jason Edens, and I have the pleasure of serving on the MREA board and following in the footsteps of the wonderful folks who have preceded me. And I also work for a Minnesota-based nonprofit solar thermal manufacturer called the Renewable Energy Alliance. The reason I bring up Minnesota is because Minnesota has recently ushered in what is arguably one of the nation's most forward-thinking and sweeping solar policy landscapes. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you the individual who was at the vanguard of that work and cemented a bright and sunny future for the state of Minnesota and a model for the rest of the nation. Michael Noble has been the executive director of Fresh Energy since 1995 and he has nearly 30 years of professional experience in energy and has been a key strategist for many major public policy innovations in the areas of energy efficiency, renewable energy development, global warming solutions, and strategies to reduce reliance on oil in Minnesota and the Midwestern region. Passion for progress is what drew Michael into fresh energy. He wanted to work full time on changing the rules of the game so that cleaner and smarter energy choices could flourish. Michael graduated from Carleton College with a BA in history. Currently, he is the chair of the Clean Energy Working Group and serves on the steering committee of RIAN. So without further ado, please help me welcome Michael Noble. Thank you, uh, Jason. Um, it's a delightful to be uh, here at the 25th annual gathering of uh, the good people of central Wisconsin thinking about our energy future. 25 years is really a long time, and that's about how long I've been thinking all day, every day, about our energy system. Um, actually, uh, Fresh Energy was incorporated just one year after this fair started. We uh, began in uh, 1990, and uh, you, you got started in 1989. Our organization is a very practical, straightforward organization whose job is to both shape public policy and then drive public policy, uh, focusing on things that are both practical and visionary uh, to create energy solutions that are beneficial for all. When I say all, I mean uh, the environment, the economy, the plants and animals and the creatures and uh, our children, our grandchildren. So that's what we focus on. And we stand on the shoulders of uh, giants like uh, you, BJ, and Carol, and I'm very, very honored to be able to be at your uh, celebration of your 25th uh, event here. When you um, first came here uh, to Custer, you were the pioneers. Uh, you were out front. Uh, you were on the leading edge, uh, thinking about uh, what kind of risks you were willing to take uh, to grow this clean energy economy. The whole industry now of wind and solar uh, owe you so much for uh, your foresight. So you were asking the hard questions, how do I get my home um, less, less reliance on fossil fuels? How do I get my business maybe uh, less reliant on fossil fuels? Could I build a house that's off the grid? Could I be more independent? Could I be more self-reliant and reliable and responsible? Could be secure uh, and long-term affordability uh, for my energy? And where we are right now, after 25 years of this conversation, is it's now time to have a conversation of the same kind for the entire energy system as a whole. Now is the time for our entire electricity system to ask the questions that you folks asked 25 years ago. Now is the time to transform our energy economy. One big driver of this whole debate there are a few black slides, and it's not broken. I just want you to look at me instead of the slides. <laughs> it's a trick. <laughs> One big driver of this whole transformation for a new energy economy is our response to the problem of climate change. Now, all the professionals tell you not to start a speech or enter, introduce yourself to an audience by talking about global warming, but the hell with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about global warming. <laughs> The good news is that the public acceptance of the basic facts of the science is growing. The good news is that last week, the United States Environmental Protection Agency uh, first announced in the whole history they were going to limit the carbon pollution from our electricity sector 
President's Clean Power Plan has been rolled out. And what really shocked me was um, how isolated the coal industry was, and that even conservative uh, politicians did not come out and attack the plan, because it's so apparent to the average people in America that it's a sensible, practical thing to reduce carbon pollution. So mostly what industry said, at least the industry uh, that I listen to most closely uh, in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the co-op electric companies and the investor-owned electric companies and the large electric companies that serve industrials up on the Iron Range, they said they could probably do it. They could reach these goals. And maybe it's because they're not as tough as they should be. But the amazing thing is that carbon emissions are now going down in America, and what the plan says is they're going to keep going down, and they're going to go down some more, and then they're going to be down. And now what you need to know is the basic science of the matter is we have to get the carbon out of the economy. We need to figure out how to run all of America prosperously without carbon pollution. That is the goal that we should all be joining in. There's a reason why Americans are confused about climate change, why you can't seem to talk about it in polite company anymore. The public has a legitimate reason why they're confused. There's a, a fraction of people in America passionately and committed belief that the science is faked, that the climate scientists are in on some big conspiracy to pull the wool over our eyes. This pie chart shows that there are 21 foundations in America that are supporting nonprofit organizations to the tune of $900 million a year to keep the public confused about the climate science. $900 million a year is going into keeping the, the, the public confused about the climate science. From 2003 to 2010, we're looking at 91 organizations funded by 140 different foundations. And these are just the four big ones. You always hear about the Koch brothers. There's actually three foundations that are funding climate denial more than the Koch brothers, including one headquartered in here in Wisconsin. But the most interesting thing to me of this chart is the largest wedge is um, the one on the bottom is $78 million a year coming from a group you've never heard of called the Donors Trust. I love that name, Donors Trust. And what that means is that you can put money into this trust anonymously and no one will ever know that you're funding having the public be confused about climate change. You can write a check for millions of dollars to the donors' trust to make sure that politicians are scared if they support renewable energy, that politicians are scared if they say that climate science is real. And I, I feel bad for the Republican Party. Even sensible, moderate, practical Republicans cannot in America say that the climate problem is real without worrying about these folks in donor trust. That is wrong. That is wrong. And you can hear it. You ask... You ask a United States senator, you say, well, what about the climate problem? And the United States senator will say, well, hey, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> well, that translates to, yeah, I know it's a serious problem, but if I say so, somebody's gonna, in my party going to run at me from the right wing and take my job away. That's what's going to happen if I say it's a serious problem. And it's because $78 million a year is coming from donors trust and another $900 million a year from 20 other foundations to make sure the politicians don't stand up and say what's right. So that's my only climate science today. No science at all, just politics. But it's not working. Over the last five years, Democrats, Independents, and Republicans all understand, increasingly so, that the evidence and the science behind global warming is persuasive. Admittedly, there's still a big partisan divide because it's almost 90% of Democrats think that the evidence is clear, but it's up now over about 50% of Republicans. So practical people in politics know that climate is a serious problem, and yet still it's polarized. We can't talk about it. These big groups, these big foundations are funding works in 34 states to roll back renewable energy standards to make sure that nobody puts any limits on carbon pollution at the state level, and to undermine this new um, climate energy plan that the um, US EPA has rolled out this past week. But we're going to pass on that today, and we're going to talk about something optimistic and hopeful, which is the new energy economy. 
And I am really incredibly excited about what's coming um, on energy efficiency, solar thermal energy, uh, biomass combined heat and power, biogas, all these diverse technologies all have big futures. But I'm just going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about wind power, and then I'm going to talk about solar power. All of the rest of those diverse technologies have an important part of the solution, but let's just start with um, wind power and solar power. I like to call it next generation wind because it's really, really so different from the wind turbines that went up five years ago. Next generation wind um, is driven by the fact that every time we install wind energy, every time we invest in wind turbines, every time we put up a wind turbine, we learn something. The technology can get better. The next generation can get better. Just like the model years of a car, the model years of, a, of wind turbines get better over time. We've had a five-fold increase in the total installed wind power in America since 2006. This is a, Sie uh, a Siemens wind turbine. I'm not plugging Siemens. Uh, other turbines by other companies are equally exciting. This is a 2.3 megawatt turbine, and the rotor diameter, the, the from tip to tip of the blades turning, is a 108 meter, so you could think about it as the um, Packers Stadium, the from uh, end zone to end zone. What, I guess the whole field plus one end zone is about 108 meters. That's how big the turning of the blades are. Now there's a little uh, company in Iowa uh, called Mid American, who is the electric company in Iowa, and they placed the largest order for these wind turbines uh, in 2013. They bought 1,050 megawatts of these wind turbines, which is about, I think, oh, installed maybe, um, what would that be? It would be, be about $2 billion, I guess, were the wind turbines they bought. Uh, and um, they put them in at five locations in Iowa. Um, and... This turbine is exciting because new technology, um, longer blades, lighter materials, um, better components, uh, less friction, uh, lower maintenance, uh, taller towers. Uh, the price of the electricity from this turbine is about 40% lower than the best turbines that were manufactured in 2009. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The price of the electricity from this wind turbine is about 40% lower than the best wind turbines manufactured in 2009. They're better turbines. And they're, they're more useful at lower speeds. Rather than kicking in at uh, 10 miles an hour, they kick in at 7 miles an hour. Rather than having shut down at 40 miles an hour, they shut down at 55 miles an hour. They're capturing more of the range of the wind, and they're larger capturing on a taller tower where it's more windy. And so what's happening is these turbines used to be economic, you know, in the Buffalo Ridge in Minnesota and in South Dakota and parts of Iowa. But more and more and more places in Minnesota are going to, more and more places in America are going to be economic for wind turbines because the wind turbines are getting so much better. I'd like to give a plug to my own electric company. I buy my electricity from XL Energy in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, in 2013, they bought more wind turbines than Mid-America. They bought 1,918 megawatts of wind turbines in Texas and Colorado and the old Northern States Power Company that serves Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin. That is about um, $4 billion worth of um, investment in wind energy. And they told me it's quite a bit cheaper than $30 a megawatt hour. Well, $30 a megawatt hour is $0.03 cents a kilowatt hour. And they said it was quite a bit cheaper, which I say it's maybe, they're saying it's about two and a half cents. Well, then I have another friend who's a developer. He said, oh yeah, two and a half cents. He said, they're doing deals now with the very best turbines at the very best price, at the very best locations, where they're getting 30-year fixed price contracts. Are you ready? For 2.3 cents a kilowatt hour. 30-year fixed price contracts. Now, one thing that the people in the room who think this through know, there's also a federal production tax credit it's worth about two cents, so that'd be about 4.3 cents per kilowatt hour is the total cost. So the taxpayers are still incentivizing it, and, and, and the electric company is paying two, two and a half cents. But what's exciting about this technology, and I love this slide, I just found this on Friday because I was trying to figure out how to talk about the cost coming down. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, 
And the way this slide works is everything that is in blue, that's the cost of the electric system power. Let's, I like to call it plain vanilla. It's like just what's on the grid, whatever's on the grid, the mix of gas and oil and coal and nuclear power and some little bit of renewables and hydro, just grid power, we'll call it grid power. So the blue is the cost of grid power. And what's happening is the bubbles are the different countries in the world. And as grid power gets more and more and more and more expensive, I think you notice your rates go up, as grid power gets more and more and more expensive, and as wind turbines get better and better and better and better and better, more and more places, the new wind turbine that you could buy would be cheaper than the plain vanilla grid power in more and more places. Already today, wind turbines are producing electricity a hell of a lot cheaper than a brand new coal plant, which is why nobody's building brand new coal plants anymore. In part, it's one reason. But soon, it won't only be cheaper than a brand new coal plant or a brand new gas plant, it'll be cheaper than everything they have on the system. Okay, think of this. The difference between something being a little bit more expensive and a little bit less expensive is not just a little bit. The difference is enormous. I want to credit, I read it in Rolling Stone this morning at breakfast. Al Gore said this. He said it's like the difference between water at 31 degrees and 33 degrees. <laughs> That's a good line. I'm going to use it, I said. Right now. Because at 33 degrees, at 31 degrees, the markets are all frozen. And at 33 degrees, everything's completely liquid. And capital is just going to flow into what we want. And we're that close. That's how close we are. That wind power is going to be cheaper than business as usual. So the big bubbles are China and the United States. And the little bubbles where wind power is in an expensive place, which is pretty windy, and they're already cheaper than plain vanilla, is in Brazil and Italy and United Kingdom and Argentina and Canada and Portugal. But these other big countries are coming soon where it'll be cheaper than plain vanilla. So think of that. Now here's the hardest slide. We need new transmission. This slide is the Midwest independent, the Mid-America Independent System Operator's slide this shows the 17 new power lines that are needed at a cost of $5.1 billion that will create market opportunities. Think of it as a road to market. Market opportunities for $50 billion worth of wind energy that's ready to be cited right now. Wind energy has contracts with a utility, has contracts with local landowners, um, anxious to get onto the grid, but needs a new pathway to market. And these 17 new transmission lines are going to be built out presumably over the next five or four or five years. Now I want to be in a dialogue with communities along the right of way, especially from um, La Crosse to Madison. I want to be in a dialogue with how this can be done in the best possible way to cite it as much as possible along the corridor of I-94 and not in ecologically important areas to keep it away from um, people and communities where it impacts are, are not needed, not wanted, over in the corridor where you're driving by and nobody gives a damn if you see a power line. I want to be in a dialogue about that because I know this power line is needed. But I hear over and over again, if we just were doing a better job on distributed generation, we wouldn't need this line. But what I want to tell you is that distributed generation is also going to be cost effective and cheaper than plain vanilla in the next five years. 80% of the people on planet Earth will be able to install solar power within five to 10 years, depending on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. 80% of people on planet Earth will be able to install solar energy for cheaper than business as usual within the next decade. Al Gore said 2020 in the article I read. So solar power is inevitable. Solar power is not just a good idea. Solar power is going to be a tsunami. It's going to be absolutely inevitable. 
that solar power just washes through the American economy. And everybody has to tip your hat. If you're wearing a hat, join me in tipping your hat. I have a hat. Tip my hat to the people of Germany. Why do we have to thank the people of Germany? The people of Germany says, we don't give a damn what it costs. We're putting it up. They put it up over the last 20 years. The people of Germany have 24,000 megawatts of solar power on their houses and, and their buildings and their co-ops. 24,000 megawatts of solar in Germany. I'm uh, sorry? And everywhere in Wisconsin is sunnier than anywhere in Germany. Everywhere in Wisconsin is sunnier than anywhere in Germany. That's a true fact. That's a true fact. On Ju June 9, just 12 days ago, it was kind of a calm day. It was a holiday. Maybe the large industries weren't running that day. It was a holiday. But on that day, on the peak demand, when everybody needed the most electricity that day that they could possibly require that day, 50.6% of the energy was solar power on that day. 50% of the country of Germany's energy was solar power at that time. So don't let anybody tell you we can't have it. It's not coming. It's coming big time. 23,100 megawatts. That's about, I don't know, 50, 75 billion dollars. Well, that's interesting. The country of Germany has about as much capital investment in solar power as all the Midwest is planning in wind power. It's about, it's about the same. Interesting, the country of Germany's economy is about 10 times larger than the economy of Wisconsin. So if Wisconsin was to have as much solar power per capita as Germany does today, you'd have to have 2,400 megawatts of solar power in Wisconsin right now. I think there's probably about, Carl, how many? Not that much. <laughs> I think politely there's about 20 megawatts of solar power in Wisconsin. That's how far the Germans are ahead. So again, should we tip our hat to the people of Germany? People of Germany brought us cheap solar power. That's what the people of Germany did. They brought us cheap solar power. This is what about I love about solar energy. It's infinite. It's truly infinite. Solar power is soon going to be cost effective wherever there's enough sunshine to make plants grow. Solar power is going to be cost effective wherever there's enough sunshine to make plants grow. That solar power is huge advantage over wind power. That solar power is enormous advantage over wind power is solar power is going to be cost effective wherever there's enough sunshine to make plants grow. An infinite supply. In one hour on planet Earth, there's enough sunshine falls equal to the total annual energy consumption of the planet Earth. In one hour on planet Earth, enough sunshine falls equal to the total annual energy consumption on planet Earth. We're not very good at collecting it. Our efficiencies are low. We're not going to cover the Earth with solar panels. But it is truly infinite in supply. I love it when my friends in the natural gas industry tell me that we have 100 years worth of natural gas. I'm like, we got five billion years on this sun. They tell me it's going to last five billion years. And for a utility resource planning, that's infinite. <laughs> Rock bottom running costs. What other technology could you buy that has no moving parts? Fuel cost is zero. The risk of the fuel cost going up is zero. zero. The risk of a carbon tax is zero. zero. Operations costs are completely free, but they're very close to zero. <laughs> the reliability of solar power is pretty well tested and proven.
Because for the first 30 years of the industry, the alternative to solar power was the longest extension cord you could imagine out to outer space. That was the alternative. So they made solar energy really super reliable for oceans and outer space and mountaintops and re remote industrial applications. But the remarkable thing is, in the 25 years that you've been meeting here at the uh, Renewable Energy Fair, the price of solar has fallen by 90%. Amazingly, the price has fallen by 80% in five years and 60% in three years. Now, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. This is the only complicated slide. Mostly just pictures, right? And no words, just pictures. I love this slide. The bars are the actual marching down the cost of solar panels. Not the cost of installed solars, but the cost of solar panels, PV panels. It's a commodity. It's like eggs. They're a commodity. There are better solar panels and worse solar, but roughly they're a commodity. And here are the cost estimates in each of the years, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, by people you think know what's going on in the economy, at least allegedly. Yeah. Barclays, Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Lazard, Stifle Nicholas, Thomas Weissel, UBS Warburg. These guys did 21 estimates of how solar panel prices would fall in time, and they were always wrong to the high side in every single analysis. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Sure. And, and you know why? Why? Germany. The people of Germany. They bought about half of the worldwide solar panels. The people of Germany drove the cost down. So now we're out here at this end. I don't have data for 2013, but the cost of a solar panel is now about 75 cents, down from four and a quarter when I started working on the subject in 2011. Isn't that amazing? I started, I never worked on solar energy at all. At all. I was only working on wind power and energy efficiency for 20 years. I started working on solar power in 2011, and the price has fallen 82% over that time period of the panels. Now you see why a tsunami is coming. The difference between 33 degrees and 31 degrees. A tsunami is coming. A tsunami of capital investment is coming to the solar industry. So we decided, well, we should get smart and learn something about solar energy. Actually, this is something we partner with, MREA. We both got sunshot grants from the federal government. We worked in Minnesota, MREA worked in Wisconsin, to study about how we could reduce the soft costs, the cost of acquiring a customer, the cost of permitting, the cost of installation, the labor costs, the racking costs, all the costs that are not the solar panels, because obviously the solar panels aren't the problem anymore. It's the everything else costs that are the problem now. It, solar panels are like... They're like buying eggs. Of course, there are organic eggs and they're eggs, but you get my point. Now, this is what Minnesota and Fresh Energy worked on over the last five years. And this is the only plug I'm going to make for Fresh Energy. I have uh, brochures about our organization, literally envelopes if you want to become a member, right here at the end. And also, if you want to be on our mailing list, put your business card or your name on a piece of paper, there's a little slot there, and I'll put you on our mailing list. That's the only plug. Obviously, we're nonprofit. We run on charitable contributions. But what we accomplished with our coalition of businesses and environmental groups and labor unions, mostly businesses and environmental groups, I admit, <laughs> what we accomplished is we increased our net metering law from 40 kilowatts to 1 megawatt. We got a 1.5% solar energy standard. All the investor-owned electric companies have to um, have solar energy in their mix by law, which is going to increase the amount of solar energy in Minnesota by 30-fold over five years. We got a 10% goal in statute. It's the goal of the state of Minnesota that 10% of all of our state electricity will come from solar power by 2030. It's soft because it's just like, hey, it's a goal. But we like to meet our goals, and utilities know it's in the law, they got to do it. I mean, they could say, well, we don't have to. And they're like, did you read the law? You're regulated by the regulators? Read the law. We got a wonderful community solar statute, which I'm not going to describe today, but I want you to steal it and replicate it and do it here. It's a wonderful statute. 
allows corporations, giant corporations, little corporations, small businesses, co-ops, community boards, nonprofits, municipalities, your bridge club, your golf club, the Kiwanis Club, the Boy Scout Troop, your environmental studies circle, your book club. Anybody can get together and own solar energy together in Minnesota now, by law. By law, anybody can own solar energy together and put it at the sunniest place you can find, the cheapest place you can find, and get the credit back on your own home elected bill. So, we, isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? Get full credit back on your own home electric bill, and what we're just dickering exactly right now on is what actually is the credit in cents. Will it be 10 cents and this stuff won't cash flow, or will it be 13 cents and it'll be a tsunami of money come into this field? Because there's only a small fraction of the people like you who will say, I am actually writing the check to pay more for my electricity. It's a small fraction. It's maybe 1%, maybe 2%. Some people think it might be 3%. But I'm in favor of the 97% who just want to have affordable, reliable, responsive electricity. And oh my God, it's cheaper too? Sign me up. Last thing is a little sidelight is that we had a head-on bid. Uh, the big electric company, Excel, um, called for bids. They had a, a requirement for peaking power, uh, a need for... Uh, uh, electrical generation on that hottest day of the year, uh, maybe it would only run 5% of the time, 10% of the time. Not a power plant that runs all the time, just kind of one you have on standby. And this clever little solar energy company said, we could do that. And so they opened the bids and there were three big natural gas fired um, power plants and a um, 100 megawatt solar proposal at 20 different locations from 2 megawatts to 10 megawatts. Uh, roughly, I guess it would be, well, let's just say the, the cost of the solar panels themselves at 75 cents a watt would be like $75 million. And then maybe the all-in cost would maybe be uh, a couple hundred fifty million dollars, maybe. Guess what? The solar energy was cheaper and they won the bid. And the gas guys were, wait, 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 I thought this was a gas, I thought this was a gas competition for peaking power. And the judge, who actually was a former Republican lawmaker from Lake Elmo, no Birkenstock guy, I tell you this guy's not a Birkenstock guy. <laughs> His argument was, hey, fair is fair, they played by the rule, it's free market, they won on price, they're cheaper, the solar guy's cheaper, give it to the solar guy. <laughs> so we're gonna have a 100 megawatt solar energy project at 20 different locations in Minnesota that won it on price alone. No, no environmental tree hug. Stuff, just on price. So now you're thinking, okay, Michael's make the case. This is a black slide. <laughs> I'm watching my clock too, because I do want to finish on time. And we're doing okay. You're thinking, okay, he's saying capital is going to flow into the space, wind power is going to be cheaper, solar power is going to be cheaper, well, efficiency is already cheaper. You got these grid issues, you got smart grid issues, you got uh, demand response, you got industrial efficiency, you got biodigestion, you got storage. Huh, storage. You should be thinking more about storage. These people were thinking about storage 25 years ago. They, they didn't have a connector to the power line, so they were thinking about storage. That's why it is a good analogy that what you were thinking about 25 years ago is now what we're thinking about for the whole economy. It's a very good analogy. But this is what I'm going to tell you this is not going to be easy. This is going to be like <coughs> rebuilding an airplane while you're flying it. It's a wicked problem. This is Lena Hansen, um, somebody I really look up to, Rocky Mountain Institute. If you want to read one book this year on all this stuff, the book you should read is called Reinventing Fire from the Rocky Mountain Institute. It's a fat book, you know, it's not a page turner, not a coffee table book. But if you want to read one book about the future of the electric industry, Reinventing Fire by the Rocky Mountain Institute. What, is that, what do I mean by a wicked problem? What's a wicked problem? It's not just a hard problem. A hard problem is a hard problem. A wicked problem is more hard. I mean, how much can solar energy and wind power do? How much? Half? Can we do half of all electricity? Well, no, Germany just did it on one day. No. They didn't do any at midnight. The answer at midnight was zero. So it's a problem. It's a hard problem. 
The definition of a wicked problem is that it has ill-defined boundaries. That's a hard problem. It includes many variables that are often conflicting. Some variables are technical. Some variables are economic. And some variables are social. Like, how do we want to be as a people? What are our values? A good example is this line from La Crosse to Madison. There are social implications. There are economic implications. There are environmental implications. Wicked problems are new. They're novel. They haven't been thought about before. They're unique. They've never been solved before. A lot of kind of problems, you give someone a problem, somebody else has already solved that problem, and you just see if this person is going to do it the same way or do it right. Problems are often like that. Like, he knows how to solve a problem, and can he figure it out? Well, this is a problem that has not yet been solved. To run the economy without fossil fuels. This is a wicked problem. Also, these problems are not often have answers that are right answers and answers that are wrong answers. They have answers that are trade-offs. Also, wicked problems do not have, are not conducive to basic testing methods of trial and error. I like to solve problems trial and error. You know, type a word in a word, in a word, word perfect and the computer tells you you spelled it wrong. Try again. Trial and error is a good tool. Wicked problems don't have that benefit. But every action you take has real consequences, and there is no immediate test, immediate feedback of whether the solution you adopted actually works. That's how wicked the problem is of figuring out how to run the economy. So now you're thinking, oh my God, now he had us up, that there was this capital flow, now it's too hard. Is, is Jeffrey here? Are you Jeffrey? He's an electrical engineer volunteering. America has the smartest engineering brains in the world. We can solve this wicked problem. We can solve this. So what do you do to solve a wicked problem? What do you do? How do you start? Where do you go? There are no boundaries, no right or wrong, no, no testing, trial and error. How do you start? What do you do? How can we learn anything? What would help us make progress? Oh, great oracle, what should we do? What is the answer to how we get started on solving this wicked problem so we can move to what we all know is inevitable? We know it's inevitable to have a clean energy economy that doesn't destroy the planet. We know it's inevitable. What do we do? We deploy solar energy and wind energy. We put it up. We build some. Build some more. Build some more after that. Keep building it. The word deployment Make some people uncomfortable. Think about 1940 in America. How many battleships can we build? How many planes can we build? How many tanks can we build? How, many, how can we move them? Not everybody's comfortable with that idea, but that's deployment. It's having the resources of the country and the resources of the industry and the resources of the political system agree that we're deploying these technologies now. We're putting them out at scale at a much bigger scale than we've ever thought about before. And that is where we find the solutions to the problems. Because the more we do, the more we discover, the more things we run into, and the more we figure it out as we go. So who would say that they're ready to start deploying at scale? This guy did last week. Warren Buffett last week doubled his current investment in renewable energy it was $15 billion two weeks ago, and now he's saying he's going to $30 billion. I don't know this guy, but I heard he's smart. I heard he knows something or other about finance and markets and the future and how things might work. I'll read you a quote that he said about deployment. We've poured billions and billions and billions into renewables, and we're just going to keep doing that as far as the eye can see. That's a pretty good definition of deployment. <laughs> we put billions and billions and billions into renewables, and we're just going to keep doing that as far as the eye can see. That's what we're going to do. That's deployment. That's what we need. That's how we solve the wicked problem, is getting practice and getting training wheels under us. 
So I'm going to just mention one thing about electric vehicles, and then I'm going to close up. I think I'm actually doing pretty well. It's 151. I was supposed to finish at 2. She said I could run over five minutes, but I should leave time for questions. Electric vehicles, I love electric vehicles. Three times the efficiency. Oh, my God, so much more efficient. They run on a fuel that even if you paid full price would be like equivalent of 50 to 90 cents a gallon of gasoline. We passed a law in Minnesota this year that all our investor-owned utilities have to offer you nighttime charging with all renewables. I pay a dollar for that. We're going to print the bumper sticker, this car runs with no carbon pollution. Why not? It's just a car. You don't have to make a big deal of it. Why do you have to run on a polluting thing like oil? Here's the key thing about electric vehicles from an environmentalist point of view. I don't ever use the word environmentalist, but I just did. <laughs> we don't use that word. It doesn't help with the other side. The grid, the electric system, is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner every year. The oil industry is getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and dirtier every year. I'll give you three examples of oil getting dirtier. Deepwater Horizon. A decade ago, deep sea drilling was drilling in 700 feet of water. Now deep sea drilling is two miles worth of water and two miles worth of earth below that. But the drill bit was four miles on Deepwater Horizon that blew out and filled up the Gulf of Mexico with oil. That's dirtier and dirtier. And that's just 10 years. That's how much further we had to look for oil. A train blows up in a little North Dakota town. Blow up one mile later, everybody would have died in an inferno in town. It, it blew up at the edge of town. Dirtier and dirtier. Digging tar sands out of the earth. And to get them into a slurry that we could move them into a pipeline that I predict will never be built. To get them into a slurry, you have to heat up you have to heat up that, that sand and that tar with a solvent that's boiled with natural gas. To put in your car? I drive my car on it. That's where, that's where I get my gasoline from the Canadian tar sands. And you might check, you probably get your gasoline from there too. Oil is getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, and electricity is getting cleaner and cleaner. Just yesterday, Morgan Stanley, you might be chuckling, I keep quoting these paragons of insight <laughs> helped our economy so strong all those years <laughs> Morgan Stanley yesterday said that quote Tesla is arguably the most important car company in the world unquote. you believe that? that's an amazing quote Tesla is arguably the most important car company in the world and then the shocking thing is an executive from the BMW company said, yeah, we think he's right. <laughs> because they're driving innovation where there's no innovation. They're showing it can be done. They're showing that you could have a really cool car that doesn't destroy the planet. That's innovative. That's pretty neat. So I have a question. Somebody in the room is going to know the answer to this question, I predict. There's an iconic... Uh, American company that's a motor corporation, not Tesla Corporation, and it came up with a very surprising announcement on Thursday of this week. That they're going to introduce an electric vehicle. And they're going to see what people think about it, and maybe, maybe some improvements, and they're going to do a little tour around the country and test it out. Communication staff person to say, Come on, put, put a little wave file with the audio right on the slide. She goes, I'm not doing that. I go, No, try it. We could try it. It's against my better judgment. <laughs> I'll tell her that it worked. You want to hear it again? 
quiet this time. in four seconds. It has 74 horsepower. It only has a 50 mile range. It's an urban bike. It's not a road bike. It's an urban bike. And they're touring around suggesting what do you think we could do with this bike and would people buy it. Maybe we could have a suggestion that uh, they have a little tape loop that makes it sound. <laughs> Okay, so if you think that's cool, take this assignment from me. Call the Harley Davidson Corporation on Monday and tell them you think it's cool. Even if you don't ride motorcycles, even if you'll never buy one, pretend that you might. Because they haven't decided to produce it, they're checking around whether the people think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. A car, a, a motorcycle made in Wisconsin that doesn't run on fossil fuels but runs on solar power and wind power, that is cool! So I'm going to wrap up. The name of the motorcycle is the Live Wire. You can suggest that they have it sound like a big hog and maybe get a laugh out of that. My closing request is that uh, you stay in a conversation with us. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm kind of a fanatic. Carl uh, is my promo guy. Carl Segrist retweets me here. Uh, uh, if you can also um, uh, read, read, read our publications. If you give me your business card or write your name and your address in an email and put it in the little box, we'll put you on our, our uh, list of um, publications, come out quarterly or whatever. But we also, if you're really, really into this stuff, we publish a newspaper every morning. Uh, it's called Midwest Energy News on the bottom here. And about two-thirds of what's in the newspaper is what we think is most interesting all around the Midwest. You know, Harley Davidson, I promise you, will be in there on Monday morning. Um, what we think is most interesting all around the Midwest. And we also now have six journalists who work for us who are covering the beat. So original news, original content, so mixed in with the stories that we pick up. So re read our newspaper. You can sign up for it online. You can also support Fresh Energy. You could click on our website and become a member or donor. You know, I know you have a lot of local institutions you're supporting. Uh, we're not a local institution, but we're working region-wide. We're working the entire Midwest. So we would love to have your support and your membership. Or if you're fabulously wealthy, um, ask us for a coffee. We'll love to sit down and talk about our business model and our plan. That wasn't too gross, was it? That was fair. And, since I'm an organizer, I never ever go anywhere without a call to action. Here's my call to action. How many people, raise your hand if you have any idea what the hell's going on in Madison, Wisconsin with the electric company there. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, that's pretty good. A handful of people. How many people get their electricity from Madison Gas and Electric? Raise your hand. Hold them high. Hold them high. Hold them high. Okay, you're the most responsible here. I'm going to tell this story. Madison Gas and Electric announced 10 days ago or two weeks ago it was going to change the way it wanted to do its rates, its electric rates. Got to get it approved by the Public Service Commission. I'm told that the Public Service Commission is likely to do whatever Madison Gas and Electric wants them to do. That's what I'm told. So what we have to do is we have to persuade the management of Madison Gas and Electric that they have a really, really bad idea. And here's their idea. Let's lower people's electricity rates, but we'll increase from $10 to $70 your right to be connected to electric utility. It used to be that it cost you $10 to be connected to our electric utility, but we're such a great electric utility 
it's going to cost you $70 just to be connected to the electric city utility. $70 if you use a lot of energy, $70 if you're low income and you use a teeny bit of energy, $70 if you generate your own energy, $70 if you only need the electric utility for backup when you're out of town in case your batteries go down, $70 a month. Madison Gas and Electric is trying to kill the solar industry in Madison. Madison Gas and Electric is trying to guarantee that they never have to deal with any of these changes that we just agreed were inevitable. Madison Gas and Electric is trying to take all the chips on the table and say they're all mine. The management of Madison Gas and Electric is trying to pull a fast one. If they win, a lot of electric utilities all over America are going to say, Al, look what they did at Madison Gas and Electric. We could pull that off too. We got an even more friendly regulatory commission than they have in Wisconsin. Well, that's not possible. That's a very friendly regulatory commission in Wisconsin. <laughs> My only political plug. So here's what you do. Call them up. Write it down. Two ways to reach them. Reach them by email. Reach them by phone. I tried it. Call the 700 252 Press 2 for a company directory. Ooh, press 2. Say the name of the person you want. Gary Walters, CEO. Oh, I'm in Gary Walters' voicemail. Hi, Gary. This is Michael Noble. I'm speaking to about 1,000 people tomorrow, and I'm going to give them your voicemail address. <laughs> Hello, Christine Euclid, the general counsel. You thought this up? Yes, I'm introducing you to a thousand of my closest friends in Wisconsin. <laughs> so there's their email addresses. There's their names. You don't have to call them all. Call one or email one. Use your phone right now if you're kind of digital. Just do it right this second and don't think about it. Right? And the message. What is the message? The message should be simple. Oh, and don't be rude and don't be mad. Be nice. Be like Wisconsinites. Be nice. And say, we think you should withdraw your proposal. We think it was a bad idea. Hasn't been thought through. Not something we can negotiate through. You need to withdraw it and then sit down with the community of Madison and talk about the future. Because this will not stand if the people of Madison speak out. Am I right? This will not stand. Okay, that's the action item. Introduced fresh energy, talked about all that. I'm going to finish with a quote. Wallace Stevens is a poet. Are the poets in the room? Raise your hand if you're a poet. Raise your hand if you love poetry. A lot of poets, a lot of poetry lovers, Wallace Stevens. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future of the world depends. But when our children will ask us in 2025 or 2030, did we do everything we could do to solve the scourge of global climate change? Did we do everything that was reasonable? The answer we want to give them is yes, we did. And it was enough to make the difference. And we avoided the most serious consequences of climate that we could leave to our children and our grandchildren. With that, I thank you very much.